in today's episode of Rob Conrad Conversations, Timothy Ray Brown. I, um, I didn't get tested at all in Spain, in Barcelona, and uh, nor Berlin at first. And, um, and then uh, this friend, um, this former boyfriend said, um, I just tested positive for HIV and uh, you should probably also get tested. Okay. And, and, and so I did. And, uh, and my test came out positive. I was HIV positive. Diagnosed with HIV in 1995, Tim also developed leukemia in 2006. I lived life and uh, um, as well as a kid, I was actually in pretty good condition. And, uh, and then about the end of the year, um, I became delirious. I couldn't, my brain wasn't functioning correctly. And um, so they thought I might have leukemia in my brain. And then about the end of the year, um, the leukemia came. But this cruel twist of fate turned out to be his biggest stroke of luck. Yeah, by, by May 2007, I um, didn't have any HIV in my blood anymore. Um, I was actually undetectable for HIV. Thanks to an unusual cancer treatment, he is the only person alive today who has been cured of HIV AIDS. Join the conversation now. Welcome to Rob Conrad Conversations. Conversations with extraordinary people that motivate and inspire. Learn, grow, and impact lives. Subscribe now and hit the bell icon for a new conversation every week. Here comes the sunshine and burns away clouds like they never were. Hey, this is Rob Conrad from Switzerland, and I'm fortunate to be able to talk to a lot of extraordinary people, but it's rare that I get to talk to someone who is truly and literally one of a kind. Timothy Ray Brown has made his way into medical history as the Berlin patient, and he was the first person on this planet to be completely cured from HIV. This makes him one of the most famous patients in medical history, and we'll talk about the very interesting story and how this was possible as this actually happened when he was treated for leukemia, we ha which he has also survived not once, but twice. And he's now an activist and wants to raise awareness for HIV and AIDS. And I'm really glad he found the time to talk to me. Thank you so much, Timothy Ray Brown. So you are one tough cookie. <laughs> well, I, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for having me on this. And uh, it means a lot to me. And I think it's great what you're doing. And uh, I guess I'm tough. I don't know. <laughs> I, I just uh, decided I wanted to survive and did. Yeah, well, not not once, not twice, but maybe three yeah. times technically, I guess. Right. Yeah, true. Yeah. Wow, true. wow, wow. Yeah. The HIV, and when I was diagnosed, it was still a death sentence. Uh, it was 1995, mm -hmm. and uh, there wasn't any really good treatment out there yet. Uh, there was only AVT, and uh, that was actually killing people. Mm -hmm. And so um, I told... Um, the doctor who wanted the doctor that tested me or told me my results that um, um, uh, I didn't want to take AZD. She was trying to get pressure me to start medication, mm -hmm. and and she said she'd give me a very small dose of it, mm -hmm. and she did, and uh, I did okay on that. And the, the luckily, luckily, new medication came out onto the market the next year, 1996, mm -hmm. and I was able to take uh, first a dual competition and then they started recommending uh, triple combinations. And so they would combine drugs and uh, um, and try to come up with the, the best treatment for people. And so I got that. And um, as soon as, uh, when, when testing viral loads, um, that viral load is uh, the amount of HEV in mm -hmm. um, uh, one milliliter of blood. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, when they could do that, I finally, I, I think it, it it started out with my viral load being above uh, the uh, the uh, um, the level of detectable, mm -hmm. and then then it got down to undetectable. Oh, okay. And so, um, at the time I got, uh, I at the time I found out I had leukemia, it was 2006, and uh, I was actually undetectable. 
for HEB. Um, so uh, that meant, meant that they could treat me basically like a normal, uh, like any other um, any other uh, patient with um, leukemia. Mm -hmm. And so I started out with uh, I started out with chemo treatment, and uh, um, and that would get my my um, the the leukemia into remission, mm -hmm. and then uh, it would uh, um, then I was supposed to get four rounds of chemo, and uh, um, unfortunately during the third round of chemo, um, I developed a sepsis infection. Oh, okay. And, um, yeah, so I uh, um, really it was really awful, and uh, I uh, um, had to uh, um, we're doing an interview. If you close the door, please. Um, you're distracting. Uh, it's my partner. He's distracting me. Um, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> okay. Uh, so anyway. Um, yeah, I had to be put into an induced coma because I was uh, breathing very heavily and uh, um, my blood pressure pressure was very low. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, I I I had a, a tendency to read everything that happened to me uh, on the internet, and uh, um, I found that the out that uh, twenty five percent of people who um, are put into those induced comas um, with uh, with sepsis infections don't make it. Wow, well, that's so, pretty high number, okay. Uh, right, so I lucked out there. And, oh, and then um, I, um, after the second transplant, uh, Dr. Gary Hooter um, said that he wanted to test my blood to see if I had any possible donors for, um, for a stem cell transplant, a bone marrow stem cell transplant. And I didn't really understand why, because in my head, um, I was going to do four rounds of chemo and then it'd be over mm -hmm. and uh, that'd be it. And I, I'd be cured of that. And, um, and he said, well, just in case uh, that doesn't work. And uh, so I said, okay. So he sent my blood to the donor bank, um, mm -hmm. the German, um, uh, German stem cell donor bank. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I would ask him every day um, how many donors there were. And it went from like zero to, um, it went up and up and up. And then finally it came out to 267 possible matches. So that's a pretty high number. Usually you yeah. don't find that many numbers. So you were lucky to, to yeah, very, very lucky. Yeah. have yeah, a good, have, is it like a blood type that you have a lot of? Um, uh, well, it's blood tissue type. It's, tissue type, okay. Uh, it's different than blood type. Um, yeah. Um, in fact, some, some people don't have any donors at all. Um, yeah. uh, I was in I'm in the hospital at the same time as a Romanian friend of mine um, who uh, who uh, actually didn't he didn't find any donors for him so he he had to get a stem cell transplant from his mother um, oh, he, okay. he, he can do it from siblings because either he didn't have any or I don't know anyway he, he did it from his mother and he didn't make it unfortunately oh that's okay. um, yeah yeah and that was kind of a drag it was kind of a drag on my psyche. <laughs> Yeah, I was kind of like, eh. yeah, that's not good. Um, so anyway, I, um, uh, yeah, um, I had 267 possible donors, and um, Daryl Hutcher came back with the idea of trying to find a donor who was immune to HIV. Um, it's one percent of Northern Europeans have an immunity to HIV, and it's. Uh, it's called um, CCR5 Delta 32, um, which means that they don't have uh, what they don't have the doorway for the HIV to get into the, the T cell. Um, okay. And so they, uh, the, virus, the virus cannot dock onto the cells. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so um, he he thought maybe he could find one of those donors or one of those. One of the people that was my donors would be might might be um have that solution mm -hmm. that yeah um so he looked and um he got permission from the professor it was a university hospital so he had to get permission from the professor to look for such a thing and he got the permission and um so he looked and looked and looked and then um i guess he started out with the uh the german part population of the 
the po possible donors and um, and he found one on the 61st try and so okay. um, then he they they petitioned this person to do it and uh, the person said yes he'd do it and uh, um, I know it's a man because I found out that it's a man who was actually German um, from the Cologne area that he was studying in New York City. <laughs> Ah, okay. So, so, so did you ever get to meet him or? No, unfortunately not. Um, uh, in Germany, um, well, with the German blood or donor bank system, you have to, um, both parties have to petition to see the other person. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't petition, petition for a long, long time, but then I finally did. And uh, um, just last year. So I haven't heard an answer yet. So hopefully I will. Um, okay. Um, so... I have no idea what the the other what the donor knows about my case at all. I don't know if he knows that he kind of revolutionized um, history uh, and HIV care. Yeah, that's the truth. Or HIV uh, look for a, an HIV cure. I have no idea what he knows. Um, I decided to I decided to look because um, a a friend of mine from Hawaii who is a professor. Mm -hmm. um, he, he is a professor at the University of Hawaii and um, said that uh, he would like to get um, get me and my donor and um, Dr. Hudrick together and invite them to Hawaii. So Okay, I, well, that would be nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so uh, at, um, at, at, that, at that point in time, did you need a transplant or was it um, um, something that was that, just, at, they wanted to try? Point, after, okay, after the second transplant, um, I found out that my leukemia was in remission. Mm -hmm. And so I actually said no to the transplant um, at okay. first. I said I'd do it if the leukemia came back. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, I lived life and uh, um, as well as, uh, as I could. I was actually in pretty good condition um, after, after having that substance infection. Um, and, uh, and then about the end of the year, um, the leukemia came, came back at the, mm. the end of 2006. And, uh, and uh, um, uh, then I said, yeah, yes, yeah, so I'll do it. And, and so they, they arranged for that, the donor to fly back to Cologne and give the stem cells. And um, with a stem cell transplant, it's not, um, they used to have to actually open up the, the bones and um, pull out stem cells from the bones. Mm. Um, uh, but now they basically give a medication to the donor, um, which is a, a medication which kicks the stem cells out into the blood, and they just filter it out. Of the, filter it out okay, of the so blood. you don't need to. I think they did it in the in the hip, right? In, in the past, they used to extract yeah. it from the hip. Right. You, right. Oh, you don't need to do it anymore. Okay. No, no, no. It's just it's very easy now. It's just basically like getting um, blood, from, like, blood transfusion or something. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Um, okay. And um, and then, uh, so the the uh, the the transplant was set up for um, February seventh of two thousand seven. Mm -hmm. And before the transplant, uh, my my partner at the time, um, he thought that he was smarter than the doctors, and he said he said he thought that uh, um, that uh, the my taking the medication would influence would. Um, reduce the chance of the uh, the stem cells to reproduce and uh, and do what they were supposed to do. And so I the said, HIV medication. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and so I talked to talked to uh, Gary Hooter about that, and he said, well, he had already brought in a protocol saying that I was supposed to take my medication and continue taking it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I told him what uh, my Partner thought Michelle, um, and uh, um, he uh, he said, "Oh well, I'll get back to you." And so he came back on the day of the transplant and uh, um, uh, said, um, "Okay, I've changed my mind. Here's the new protocol." And um, and uh, so it basically said that I would quit. I would take my medication on the day of the transplant and not take it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so so um, and that's actually kind of important because if I had kept taking taking my medication and um, they would, wouldn't know for a long, long time after that if I were, were cured or not. 
cured from HIV in that case. Right, cured from HIV, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the medication pushed your levels below the thresholds of, of where you can measure it? Detection. Yeah, detection. The, the, yeah. the level of detection. Okay, threshold. Of right. Okay. And, um, and uh, so I, yeah, I quit taking my HIV medication on the day of my transplant and never took any after that. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, and then and, at what point did you find out that the HIV was gone? I mean, I guess... Um, Okay, um, I I realized that um, I, well, I went to uh, um, a rehab center um, and uh, um, and then finished that and then decided to go back to work and then go um, go back to the gym. Mm -hmm. And with with HIV, I had not been able to gain muscle muscle mm -hmm. weight or uh, actually had any definable muscles, um, but. Um, Without HEB, um, I uh, I was starting to gain muscle weight, and um, I was starting to show muscles. <laughs> so you were feeling better. You were you yeah. had sort of better health, Joe. Okay, definitely, definitely, yeah. And um, and uh, and then clinically, um, because I wasn't taking medication anymore, um, they my viral load went really, really high. Um, I'm not sure exactly how high, but um, then. It, Dropped, slowly dropped down to um, by May May of 2007 it was undetectable. Okay, so I it wasn't saw. in is it wasn't right after the transplant that you no. they were going down. So the first no. there was a they went up yeah. and then they started yeah. to go down. Yeah, right because there was no, no nothing to prevent it from from re reproducing. Okay, at first. So so it yeah. takes a while for the for the stem cells to um, basically get, take action in your body and and become active. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, so anyway, yeah, by, by May 2007, I, um, didn't have any HIV in my blood anymore. Um, but unfortunately there can be, um, blood or there could be HIV in reservoirs, like in the gut or, mm -hmm. um, the brain or, uh, um, lymph nodes. And, uh, so it's kind of unethical to do, to check people's brains to see if they have it could be in the brain. Um, so how do you uh, do that? Put, drill a hole? Well, uh, <laughs> after the second transplant, um, I had to get a second transplant because uh, the leukemia came back. Mm -hmm. And that was, the leukemia came back at the end of 2007. And then um, I got another transplant in 2008, um, mm -hmm. like about a year after the first one. Like Was it from later. the same donor? Yeah, from the same donor, yeah. And... Um, and that one didn't go as well as the first one. Um, I, for a while, was, um, well, I became delirious. I couldn't, my brain wasn't functioning correctly. And um, so they thought I might have leukemia in my brain. Um, so they, they decided to do a, a brain biopsy and, of course, check for HIV, too. I see. Okay. Of course, that was probably the re main reason they wanted to do the biopsy, but... Um, yeah, um, unfortunately, uh, the surgeons left an air bubble in my brain, and um, and I became more delirious. Oh, okay. So it yeah. went downhill from there. Yeah, um, and uh, but then they did an emergency surgery and removed the bubble. But just having the bubble there um, for that short time um, affected my my balance. Uh, even to this day, my balance isn't great. Okay. I, I do a lot of work on that. Um, physical therapy and uh, yoga, mm -hmm. but it's still not perfect. There's some sort of um, neurological damage yeah, from that bubble. Right, that yeah, was such a yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, uh, the initial initial damage um, basically left me bedridden. Um, so I was in bed, could, couldn't move, um, incontinent. Um, and uh, so at some point, uh, Dr. Huger told my, my partner, Michelle, and his sister, uh, who was a nurse, that uh, there was nothing else they could do for me. So they sent me home and uh, and gave me morphine patches. Okay. And, uh, um, yeah, they've basically given up on me. Um, so just it, treat the yeah. suffering, but there's nothing else we can do. Right, exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, my my boyfriend, former boyfriend at that point, because um, we had broken up because I had a crush on a straight boy at the gym. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, he uh, 
he didn't want to believe it. And so he, he started looking for other places to send me away from the, that hospital, the original, original hospital. Mm -hmm. And so he um, found a clinic for, uh, with the help of a, an oncologist um, uh, who actually diagnosed me at first. Um, uh, he found a clinic for people with extreme brain injuries. Mm -hmm. And so I was taken by ambulance to that. And, um, and um, I, when I got there, I couldn't, I was, I was in bed. I couldn't move. Um, I was incontinent. Uh, and uh, the nurses were too busy with all the other patients that they had no time to clean me up. And, uh, and so my, my partner would have, have to come in and, or my ex partner would have to come in and clean me up. Okay. Okay. So but, what, and, were, were, yeah. you, were you conscious or were you in a state of like delirium? Yeah, I, was, I was conscious. I was conscious, but, um, yeah, I was pretty in bad condition. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't even realize this was all going on. I didn't know about it until later. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, basically, um, Michelle, Michelle allowed the, uh, the, um, the, uh, doctors in the hospital to take all the glory for coming up with a cure for HIV and all that. Um, but he, he wanted to point out that there was more to the story that they had basically given up on me. And, uh, mm. um, yeah. Um, uh, so anyway, I, I was given a physical therapist at the, this clinic and, um, um, uh, and that clinic got me out of my wheelchair uh, into or no in, out of bed into a wheelchair and then um, from the wheelchair after several days to a walker and then eventually to walking mm -hmm. well wow. okay so so i i learned to walk again so then that like, took a few years to of, of therapy uh well a few weeks a few, oh, yeah. few weeks okay. yeah a few weeks yeah uh, so um yeah it seemed like several days but i think it was several weeks uh okay um yeah um so a good friend of mine from, from, well, from Seattle, where I grew up, um, uh, just said that she was going to come and visit me to basically say, say goodbye to me. And, uh, and, uh, she, I knew she was coming and then she showed up and, uh, and, uh, so when she showed up, she, she saw I was walking and mm -hmm. so like, she was, wow. was a surprise. Yeah. Yeah. Big surprise. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I, uh, I, oh, my mother came, came and visited me seven times while during this period that I was in the hospital. And uh, in fact, afterwards, uh, um, I, I won a trip to, to Turkey, to, uh, to uh, um, the Turkish Riviera. And uh, she's like, no, I'm sick of Europe. So I'm sick of Europe. I don't want to go. <laughs> and actually, I it was actually good because um, the whole tour was in German, and um, and so I I invited a friend who speaks German um, from a friend from from Seattle actually um, to go, and so uh, yeah, we had, had a good time. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, and and so so now at this point you're completely free. You didn't have any any. Um, are you still undetect undetectable? So it's completely out of your system. The agent. Now, yeah. yeah. You mean now? Yeah, yeah. I'm okay. completely undetectable. Um, I uh, don't take HGV meds, um, except that I do. I am taking PrEP, um, which you can only take if you're negative, mm -hmm. HGV negative, and uh, because I um, am quite sexual active. So. Okay. Uh, PrEP is, uh, could you explain what that is? Um, it's, uh, um, PrEP is... Uh, um, it's, it's Truvada. It's, uh, um, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Ah, okay. So it's a medication you, you yeah. take so yeah. that you cannot it, infect yourself again, basically. Yeah. It's, it's an HIV med medication that they determined, uh, basically prevents, uh, reinfect or infection. Okay. Of, not, not in my case, reinfection, but, um, it's actually, um, a, was approved by the CDC as, as being the, only, the American um, 
Center for Disease, Disease Control for being the only, um, only um, true safe sex. Okay. Okay. So it's 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 a hundred percent basically safe if yeah, you take yeah, it, if you take if you take it according to the protocol. Yeah, you have to take it every day uh, to for it to be safe. Okay. Um, yeah, there are studies where people take it as needed, but um, but uh, I don't like uh, like having that that um, basically. Uh, you want to be ready at any time. Let's put yeah, it this exactly. Way. exactly yeah. <laughs> let's put it this yeah. way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I see. And so so. Um, has there ever been any evaluation if you could even reinfect? I mean, your body get rid of yeah. the virus. So I, no, it cannot. Um, uh, well, um, I couldn't before I started taking prep, and um, because I take prep, I definitely could not. Okay, but but um, we, we, without without that medication oh. that you're taking now, could there be a chance that you're really immune now, or um, would it be like a gamble? No one knows, basically. I was basically immune, um, except that uh, I was immune to um, any virus that um, uses the, the CCR5 entryway to get into the cell. But there's also another entryway called um, CXCR4 or X4 virus, okay. um, which could, um, it's very rare, but it could actually um, use that, the vi that virus could use that entryway to get into the, the T cell. So, okay. so, so, so there are different mutations of the virus, basically. Right. Yeah. I yeah. Um, and uh, um, evidently, I did actually have have X4 virus in me um, before uh, before the treatment, and uh, um, but my my immune system got rid of that, so I don't have don't have that anymore. Okay. Okay. And and the cancer is also gone. Yes. Yes. That's okay. So. And and it's been it's been. 10 years since um, since the last um, stem cell transplant. Mm -hmm. Stem cell transplant, and they say, I'd say after five years, it probably won't return. Okay, well, congratulations. Yeah. So you yeah. you and are, I, I, you must be playing the lottery a lot, a lot, I guess. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. We had, I actually bought tickets, tickets last night for our, our lottery. Um, you could actually win $1.4 billion. Oh, okay, well, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that's Super Bowl. I, I mean, Right, I doubt it's gonna happen, but well, I mean, you 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 bet the uh, odds a few times already, so who knows? <laughs> right, sure, sure, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> okay, um, so let, let's go back maybe in a bit in time. Um, so you're originally from the U.S. and you came to Europe or to Germany in the early '90s. Yeah, I I in '91, and that was because I um, I had taken a break from work for three months to um, I do yeah, that too. To uh, um, to go on a trip with some friends and uh, um, and travel around Western Europe and Greece and uh, mm. got back got back went back to work and uh, back to Seattle mm -hmm. and went back to work and I was working in banks mm -hmm. and uh, I just kind of decided I was bored with banks and and that I wanted to move to Europe. Mm -hmm. And so um, I decided to move in, um, I, let's see, I got back in um, March of 1990 mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, um, decided to move to Barcelona in 1991. Okay. Yeah. And so I did. And um, uh, so it was like spring of 1991, I moved to Barcelona with a friend and then um, <clears throat> I was supposed to meet that friend and some other people in in Berlin. Uh, and, well, actually, they were they were going to go earlier, and I um, was going to catch up with them. And um, so I went up and stayed where I was supposed to stay in Berlin, and uh, um, and waited for them to call. And this is in the days with no cell phones, so I. <laughs> I waited and waited and waited, and luckily, luckily, I had fun. Uh, otherwise, uh, so yeah. Um, so that was that was the first. No, actually, the second time I'd been in Berlin because mm -hmm. I had been in Berlin in 1990. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, by that time, the wall was gone. Mm -hmm. um, the The first time I was there, there was the wall was still there, and there was still checkpoints that you had to go through to mm -hmm. get into um, into East Berlin. 
Mm-hmm. And, um, and, uh, but 1991, it was completely gone. Um, and, uh, um, it was kind of very exciting time for Berlin. But have okay. you been to Berlin? Um, I've been to Berlin a few times. Yeah. yeah but uh, uh, long, long ago now, then the last time was around 15 years ago, but I've been there a few times. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. It's a crazy city. It's a crazy city. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. And so, so back in the nineties, was there like an active gay community? Um, in Berlin? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, yeah. Uh, I actually, I hung out with, um, with drag queens and I hung out with a lot of people in East, in East Berlin at first. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, um, so this one apartment, uh, for some reason, the, the phone company had, hadn't discovered that they had the phone yet. And so, <laughs> So you were waiting for a call that could not get through. Uh, no, this was this was like I'm um, just hanging out uh, with them. Um, uh, anyway, I decided to I could make phone calls to anywhere in the world for free, so I did. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. Right. And then and then there was also a telephone booth. That, um, you remember what those are? <laughs> yes, yes, I've I've seen yeah. those in my childhood. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there was a telephone booth, and um, basically you could make calls around the world from from that. And yeah, I did that too. Um, yeah, so that was nice. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, I I I was there for that visit, and then decided to uh, um, to go back to Barcelona, and uh, and. I had met somebody in Barcelona, in Berlin, and I asked him if he wanted to go with me back to Barcelona mm-hmm. and, um, or spend some time with me there. And he said yes. So he, I, I took off first, and then um, he came, he came a couple of days later. And, um, and then because we were, um, my, my bedroom was actually a closet, a big closet in, in this apartment. And, uh, and it had no no windows that that closet and so we slept out in the living room Mm -hmm. and uh so um we slept naked and um and uh the sheets came off and and, um so in the morning my syrian roommate came out to make coffee and uh and saw that we were naked on the floor and uh and so he later says, um, uh, you do that again, um, I'm, I'm throwing yourself off the balcony. Uh, okay. And, and, and I thought, in my head, I thought, I didn't say this to him. I thought, okay, you throw myself off the, off the balcony, your stuff's going off the balcony. Uh-huh. We were on the fifth, fifth floor. Um, and um, so next, the next night, same thing happens. Um, and that time he says, um, you do that again, I'm throwing you off the balcony. And mm-hmm. so... Um, I said to my, my friend Matthias, uh, um, I, I don't think this is safe anymore. And he said, well, you can come back and live with me in Berlin. And, I and so I said, yeah, I said yes. And that's what I did. Okay. So then you moved back from Barcelona to Berlin. I understand. Yeah. 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 And then, so, then you started living there for a while and you got a job there, I assume? Yeah. I, I, I worked for the British military at first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, in the kitchen and then, um, I decided decided to go back to Barcelona, mm-hmm. and so I did, and uh, was there for about a year and a half, and then and then moved back to Berlin permanently um, from ne- um, October nineteen ninety three till I left in December of two thousand ten. Okay. okay. Yeah. And so then, when did you um, get diagnosed with HIV? Um, I had, I'd been tested in Seattle before I left, um, in like nineteen. 19- 1991 and uh tested negative mm-hmm. um and uh and then um i um i didn't get tested at all in spain in barcelona and uh nor berlin at first and um and then uh this friend um this former boyfriend uh not matthias a different one um uh uh said um I just tested positive for HEV and uh, you should probably also get tested. Okay. And, and so I did. And, uh, 
and my test came out positive. I was okay. HIV positive. Okay, so you, so and, you, got, you got infected by him, or is it just one one? Um, yeah, but that, no, it, it was probably I infected him. Um, yeah, you infected him. Yeah, probably. Okay, it, it, didn't, it didn't matter to either of us. Um, uh, yeah, um, and I I think I know um, how I got infected, but um, yeah, but. Uh, um, Okay, so so you you know you know the person who most likely infected you, probably yeah yeah. Um, uh, I don't really think that matters that much because uh, it just happened. Yeah, at the end um, of the day, you can't I, change it. Yeah, yeah, everyone. Yeah, you can't change it, and everyone is responsible for themselves. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, yeah, I, I don't like I don't like blaming people for things. No, no. Okay. Okay. So, um, so yeah. what 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 was it like? I mean, when you when you uh, first um, got the diagnosis back in the days, the medication wasn't at the level that right. it is today. So, so how what was your first um, reaction? Uh, well, kind of the first, the first. Oh, well, I was I was I just started university um, in Berlin, and my my reaction was to keep doing what I was doing and. Uh, I was also working in a cafe and, uh, um, and, um, I found the whole time I was in Berlin that it was a very open place and, um, and people were very accepting of, of the way you were. And, uh, and I didn't, I didn't really feel stigma at all, you know, there, um, from anyone. Um, in fact, uh, I, I told my, um, I told my, most, most of my, my, um, my, the people with whom I was attending university and also the people that I worked with, with that I was HIV positive. Okay. I mean, I didn't walk, I didn't walk around the cafe yelling, Hey, I'm HIV positive. Mm -hmm. Here, have a drink. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, okay. But, but, but for, 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 you, for yourself, did you, did you kind of push away the severity of this news? Um, did you ignore it for a while or? Yeah, pretty much. Um, well, basically, I, I just I didn't I didn't want to die from it, and uh, um, it kind of hit me hard when um, when the friend who told me that I should get tested said, you know, you probably only have about two more years to live. And oh, wow. okay. I'm like, so, oh, yeah. So at that, at that point, um, diagnosis was uh, quite bleak. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, people were dying right and left up to up to, up to that point. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, you, in the beginning of the um, conversation, you mentioned those um, ACT drugs. I think you call them. Yeah, ACT. Yeah. ACT drugs. So, so uh, that that's a different drug drug than they're using today, right? Right. Yeah. Today, today, um, today, the treatment is very good. In fact, um, the treatment is so good that people with HIV can actually live a, a, a normal life lifespan. Um, basically about the same as people without HIV. Um, um, the, uh, the, oh, one reason for that is that, uh, um, a lot of people that don't have HIV don't see their doctors, um, particularly men don't like to go, go to doctors and, uh, um, and so they, they don't really treat their health well as, they, as well as they should most i'm saying most not not all but um yeah uh but people people who um have hiv see their doctors regularly um it used to be i think it started out that i had to go to the doctor once a month um i don't think it's that way anymore um uh now i see a doctor quarterly okay so yeah um but I mean, I'm, I'm not. I, I, that's because uh, in order to uh, in order to stay on on prop uh, on Truvada, you have to basically prove that you are still HIV negative. I see. And for that reason, they test your blood for a regular basis. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so, so when you got infected, how did your surroundings, uh, your your friends, your family, how did they react? Um, I didn't, my mother was dealing with, dealing with breast cancer and I grew up, um, just with my mother. Um, I don't know my father at all. Um, and, uh, um, she was dealing with breast cancer, so I didn't tell her at first. 
Okay. I think it took, I, I told her after about a year. Um, and uh, um, when I told her, she cried. Um, and uh, um, and friends dealt with it pretty well. Um, my my boyfriend, well, actually, when did I meet him? Um, I didn't meet him until like 2006. Uh, um, and actually had unsafe sex with him. And then I'm like, oh my God, what have I done? And, uh, and then he, uh, he told, I told him, I have something to tell you. I'm HIV positive. And he's like, that's okay. I am too. And so, yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, he, he's actually probably one of the main reasons why I'm alive. Um, not only the fact that he, uh, basically saved me from being put to, um, from a slow death from morphine, um, he uh, basically showed me a lot of love. Yeah, yeah. And and came to the hospital every day, and yeah, even after we weren't together anymore. More. Okay. okay, and that's great to have someone who's really supportive and yes, is there for you in, in the darkest of times. Yeah, definitely, definitely. definitely. Um, so maybe for for those who are not too familiar, can you explain the difference between HIV and AIDS? What's the Okay, um, HIV, HIV is a virus, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is usually um, spread through uh, fluids, mm -hmm. um, uh, bodily fluids, like blood, um, semen, mm -hmm. um, even pre-cum. Uh, uh, pre-cum has a very high high amount of, uh, has much more, much more HIV than semen. Uh, oh, salt. okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, through breast milk, um, but it, um, because of something that's come out recently, uh, um, which is in the United States, it's U equals U. I think in the German, German-speaking um, areas of the world, it's N equals N. Mm -hmm. it, uh, um, uh, uh, undetectable means untransmittable, um, uh, and uh, uh, and it's one hundred percent that. Um, as long as as long as the person as long as the person that uh, um, is having sex with another person or or um, say mothers um, mothers that uh, um, are breastfeeding their their babies uh, as long as they're undetectable they cannot transmit it to to the babies which is actually um, very important for women um, who are, um, child, childbearing women. Mm -hmm. um, I I talked to a, a woman who uh, who has been HIV positive since birth, and uh, she was born with HIV, and uh, and she she she's had had two or three children, and she said I always thought I couldn't breastfeed, so I didn't, mm -hmm. and and uh, she said, I would have loved to have been able to. Okay. So yeah. So it's important I, to know that that they can do it if it's undetectable. Right, right, yeah. Um, and, so, and, and, and then, uh, so HIV is the virus that gets transferred, and then yeah, AIDS yes. is... Um, AIDS is basically when, it, um, when, when uh, the patient, the person starts to have um, opportunistic infections, um, mm -hmm. or they have, uh, or their, um, their CD4 count falls below 300 um, copies per... Uh, 300 cells per um, milliliter of blood. Okay, so it's um, it's, a, it's a set of symptoms that you have as a right, result yeah. of HIV. Yeah, and the, and the opportunistic infections can be uh, pneumonia, um, uh, um, toxoplasmosis, which is basically um, it's a, a, um, an organism that um, um, toxo is an organism which is in Cat, and cats, cats, I think, and cats, cat species, um, and uh, um, and then um, one thing that people you saw a lot of um, in the days of uh, of um, uh, a lot of people having HIV was um, Carposis uh, um, sarcoma, I think. Sarcoma, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, KS, yeah, and. Um, so 
those, yeah, those are the opportunistic infections that are AIDS. Um, and uh, people people really don't talk about AIDS that much anymore. Um, it's more um, more proper to talk about, about HIV. Um, and uh, so um, I I would say that um, I'm not cured of HIV. I'm cured, or I'm not cured of cured of AIDS. I'm cured of HIV. I see. Um, yeah. So okay, okay. This is just I just, just I think it's, it's important to understand for some people who might, might not be familiar um, right. what it, what it, that line is. Okay, and so so at any point, so you were infected from uh, you said ninety six to around um, ninety five ninety five to around yeah. two thousand and six seven seven around two thousand seven yeah okay did right. did you ever develop the symptoms of AIDS? Um, no, I didn't. Okay. Uh, um, I did have a, uh, um, I had a, a CD4 count below 300, um, which at, um, at the time I, um, at the time I came back to the United States, um, basically if you had had a, um, a, uh, a CD4 count below, um, 300, um, you were considered to be AIDS, an AIDS patient. Um, and uh even if you were in better in better health than than before so when i came here i came back here i was um i was cured of hiv but technically i um i was an age age, age patient i see i see okay kind of weird, but yeah um and go ahead. so that doctor that that started the treatment that was um an ex purely experimental treatment at the time yes yeah um he actually was a hematologist and had absolutely nothing to do with 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 it, HIV before my case. Mm. Yeah, and so um, for that reason, um, people didn't really want to believe that uh, um, a hematologist, as basically um, somebody finishing their studies, um, he was wasn't really even completely finished with set, his studies. Um, also, he, he was still he, very young. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, they didn't want to believe that um, that um, he could cure HIV. <laughs> okay, but but how how did he um, know about this? Or how did he think about this? I mean, he must he must um, know with the idea that that's, that there might be a theoretical chance that it might happen. So how did he come up with that? He he, he paid attention in um, his classes and had heard about um, about that uh, that um, mutation. Mm -hmm. It's basically a mutation, a good mutation, um, which uh, basically makes people immune to HIV, and uh, does, and so does not he, have any negative symptoms. Right. He, okay. um, yeah. He and he hypothesized with no no real clear understanding if it would work or not. Mm -hmm. um, he hypothesized that uh, if um, somebody with HIV um, were given, um, if their immune system was replaced by one that Basically, um, was immune to HIV mm -hmm. that um, they would in fact be immune to HIV, and uh, and so he tried it and it worked. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. And so, so um, has this ever been repeated? Um, yeah, well, successfully no, but um, uh, in two thousand. In December 2010, right before I moved to the United States, mm -hmm. uh, back to the United States, uh, um, I had dinner with Garo, and he said that uh, he that they had tried it with ten, eight different patients, mm -hmm. and they had all passed away from their original illnesses, other than HIV. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so, so it's, uh, it's it's not something that you could use as a general cure because the process of doing the stem cell therapy is highly risky in itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In in itself, it, it's basically about fifty percent. Um, oh wow! Okay, so it's really it's, it's yeah, yeah okay, yeah. Um, and and and, and the, at that point, were you aware of that, or did you not have any other chance uh, because the cancer was so progressed? That... Yeah, I, I didn't have any other chance choice. Yeah, basically, it was an experiment that um, was had to be done. Okay. Okay. What, what, what would you have done it if you did have the chance? Mm. Um. When I was when I'm I was sorry, uh, you, okay. sorry, you're, you're half out of out of the screen. If you could just move oh, a little sorry. bit. Oh, yeah, sorry, it's better. Yeah, perfect. Oh, so when I um yeah I moved my hand um 
So when I was thinking about whether I should do it or not, um, and well, my, well, my leukemia was in remission. Um, I thought, well, um, basically I'm doing fine with HIV med medication and, uh, and I can keep taking the, these and do, do fine with them. And, and by that time, by that time, I was already at, at the point where basically, um, people with HIV were living as long as other people, um, that don't, didn't have it. And, uh, and, uh, so for that reason, I decided I didn't want to do it mm. unless leukemia came back. Mm. And, uh, um, so, um, yeah, I was recently asked uh, if I would do it, if I had to do it all over again. Um, uh, if I were in, in a situation where I wouldn't live or not, or wouldn't, wouldn't live if I didn't do it, I'd do it. Otherwise probably not. Okay, because the, the risks are so yeah. high and, and the, the, the HIV is quite manageable at this point. Right, yeah. Um, and for that reason, it's very difficult to find, uh, um, find uh, people willing to do, do participate in studies. Mm. Um, because uh, basically people that, are, that participate in studies are doing it purely for altru altruistic reasons. Um, uh, they're not really doing it for themselves um, because there is no guarantee that they will have any clear benefit from it. And um, so it's very difficult to find people to say yes to doing, doing, um, doing, doing the treatments that might kill them. I see. I see. So um, as an, as an, you're an act activist now mm -hmm. and you, you fight for awareness for, uh, of, of HIV, um, how do you see the situation now compared to 20 years ago? You said it's um, become manageable. It's become easier. You can live as long as you, as a, as a any person who is not affected. So, yes. how has the situation changed? Um, <clears throat> the situation has changed in that uh, because it's manageable. Because basically, you can you can be HIV positive and hide it. Nobody nobody has to know unless you decide to reveal it. Um, you just have to take your medication. Um, and, uh, as long as you take your medication, you'll be fine. Um, <clears throat> the, there isn't as much active activism, um, toward, uh, well, toward finding the cure or, um, a, uh, vaccine, vaccine, sorry, HIV. Um, uh, I, <clears throat> I, that, that's in, in the developed world. Um, That's in the United States and Europe and um, other places uh, that are highly developed. Um, <clears throat> um, unfortunately, um, the situation in um, Africa, for example, has improved, but not completely. Completely, um, people are still dying of um, AIDS in, in those countries um, in in the develop, developing world and. For that reason, I think a cure is necessary. Okay, and, so, uh, so it has to become less of a problem where you have the, the access to the funds to manage it well. But right. in those countries who not, don't have that access, um, it's still a big problem. Yeah. And okay. And um, oh, and and Eastern Europe is a mess as well. Oh yeah. Now. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, for example, um, uh, well, I I talked to to this woman on Facebook for a long time. And, um, she, um, over a period of about a year, um, and she, she's HIV positive and, uh, she, she was getting care, but, um, really bad care people, mm -hmm. um, like doctors would, um, get more money if they, they agreed to do, to treat people with HIV. Um, there's still a huge amount of stigma. Mm -hmm. And she said that they get old drugs, like, Drugs that are are even rejected uh, or not used in in uh, um, in Europe and, and the United States um, because they're not good. So they had first generation AIDS medication or HIV yeah, medication. Yeah. Okay, exactly. Um, and uh, and that's that's in Russia. I mean, you'd think that Russia would be one of the better ones because mm -hmm. it's got more money than other places. Um, 
uh, yeah, I mean, it's probably because it's so um, highly uh, cheered in the the wealth. Mm. Because um, and people that have money there don't um, usually don't freely give their money out to poor people. Okay, I see. So, uh, but because my, my my feeling was that um, when I look at the generation after me, so the <laughs> kids of my 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 friends and the mm -hmm. uh, younger generation. Um, They don't seem to care as much anymore. I mean, right, yeah, I mean yeah. my age, we used to be scared of, of HIV mm -hmm. and yes. um, you know protect ourselves in any way possible, right. yeah. as mm -hmm. long as you know it was reasonable. But um, nowadays, the kids don't seem to care anymore. It seems like right. they like, yeah, it's it's it's, it's yeah. nothing will happen. And is that a problem? Do you see that? Uh, yes, it is. Um, uh, For example, the uh, the rates of new infections are very high, and like um, I think up till to the ages of 27, um, they're very high. And actually, actually, uh, because of uh, because of Viagra and other um, uh, um, uh, things that you can take for rectal rectal dysfunction. Um, They're actually high in people over 65, believe it or not. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. So yeah, they're um, becoming active now and then. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I, um, I had an opportunity to speak in several high schools in um, the area around, around Palm Springs, California, in the county where, where it is. And, uh, and uh, I, I don't think that apart from, apart from, um, us coming into the school, I don't think they even talked about HGV at all. Not even at school. Not even so it was one yeah, part of the yeah, agenda. Right, wow. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, um, that's not good. It's yeah. It's sad. Um, and I also heard that uh, um, like uh, non-gay um, couples, uh, they would uh, have anal sex because it doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, you can't get pregnant. To, uh, right. Yeah, you can't get pregnant. Right. Well, yeah. Forever. Yeah, and and anal sex is probably is definitely the most dangerous um, form of sex you can have in in terms of risk of infection. Okay, okay. Is that because there are more um, like injuries to? Um, yeah, it, it's because the the skin um, of the uh, the uh, um, anal passages is only one layer of skin, whereas. Mm -hmm. The rest, the rest of your skin, you have three layers of skin. Okay. You, you only have like um, the dermis or something like that. I don't okay, know. So it makes it easier for the virus to pass through. Basically. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And and uh, then uh, there's more chance of bleeding um, from friction, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, okay. And uh, um, yeah. And now combine it with the fact that precum has a higher Right. Yeah. Uh, people, virus people, loads, and then yeah, even people, if you pull out. It doesn't help really much. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. People think that okay, precum doesn't have, isn't dangerous. Yeah. Doesn't it count is. as well. Yeah. Precum doesn't <laughs> doesn't count. Count. Anal doesn't exactly. count, so we're good. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Um. Yeah. And uh, I think that there's a, this idea that if you get HIV, it's no big deal. <laughs> But because you can take medication, and uh, so you have to take a pill every day. <coughs> um, so when I started, I had, had to take many, like over 20 pills a day. Um, uh, um, now, now it's down. Um, some reg regimens are only one pill a day. Okay, so, um, <coughs> so it's, they're combinations of three different medications in one pill. So it's almost almost like taking vitamin a day and then you're good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, last year I was invited to be a part of this conference in Seattle, mm -hmm. and um, uh, the person that invited me asked me to participate in um, a seminar on HIV cure, mm -hmm. and um, so I said yes and. Um, um, he started, well, basically this was the whole thing. Um, 
he asked people what they thought of HIV care mm-hmm. and, um, and uh, for themselves or for other people. And um, I, I think about 70% of the people in, in that room, and these are HIV activists, activists and people that um, have HIV and, uh, and should know a lot about HIV and probably do. Um, they, I felt that about 70% of people said they did not want to cure. They did not want to cure for themselves? Um, yeah, or in general? Or in general, yeah. Why is that? Um, basically, because uh, because they they okay. For one thing, their their identity was based on being HIV positive, mm-hmm. and um, and um, they because well, in um, countries like the United States, Switzerland, um, Europe, mm-hmm. uh, they they get benefits. Um, they, a lot of people don't have to work because they are HIV positive. And uh, um, so they fear, oh, some people's housing are based on the fact that they have, have HIV. Um, uh, they get dental care, medical care. So they, they're afraid if they, if they get cured, they lose all the benefits. Right, exactly, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, so that's... And um, benefits are not as good in the United States as in Europe, obviously. <laughs> No, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, this most, I, I'd say most of the people that were in the room were, were from the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> um, I think I, I'm on this group, this Facebook group called international group for people with HGV and those who love them. Mm-hmm. And, um, I always got the idea that, uh, those, the people on, in that, in that group, in that Facebook group wanted, wanted, HIV cure to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, they wanted to be cured themselves, and uh, they wanted to be, they wanted other people to be cured. I think water. Um, so, sorry, I had to get a new bottle. Let me open it. Yeah, so it's, it's basically it's about the the monetary benefits that you get from from exactly exactly yeah that's it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, um, I th- and I think the fact that people are saying that they don't want an HIV cure um, will lessen the pressure on the government to um, to fund a cure. Okay. So Your research and so yeah, less activism, uh, less government funding, less government funding, less less exactly, awareness. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and I think that's sad because it, it's something that needs to happen. Yeah. So so, so um, what are the things that you are talking about and fighting for? I mean, besides the obvious, your story is, is of course I guess mm-hmm. one thing, but uh, what, what's important for you in terms of um, awareness? What's important for you in terms of your speeches that you give and um, my speeches, um, okay, if I'm, I'm not, I've been kind of evaluating this in my head, whether, um, my speeches are different from speaking to, um, to, uh, scientists, um, people at universities, um, and patients, uh, or, or people with HIV. Um, uh, I think for people with HIV, I give them hope, them hope. Mm-hmm. And uh, for for the scientists, I, I give them a reason to keep going with their research. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and I'm not really sure if, uh, if my speech differs. I I I I used to uh, I used to give my speeches. Um, well, I used to actually read my speeches um, written by other people. <laughs> Okay. Um, I don't don't do that anymore. I um, I'm going going to the bedroom because people are talking with her. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I quit doing that and um, basically just give my speeches. I mean, I know my story, so um, yeah, I don't I don't need to prepare things for anymore. 
definitely understand. Right. Yeah. Um, so did I answer your question? No, I, yeah, 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 you did, you did. So, so it's okay, about, it's, it's, in general, it's about the awareness, not forgetting about that. It's, it's still a disease that yeah. might be more yeah. curable, but it's still a very severe disease and uh, right. a very risky right. one. Exactly. And we shouldn't neglect it just yeah. because it's manageable. Yeah, I understand. Exactly. Okay, okay. Um, you, you said you have a partner now. Is he yes. positive or negative, if I may ask? Positive. He's positive. positive. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, Nearly 30 years. Okay. Yeah. And he is on medication mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and undetectable. Okay. So because he's undetectable, he cannot infect anyone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see. So, okay. Yeah. So that's, so it's, it's still managed, I guess. Okay. Right. Um, if you think back, I mean, you, you went through several severe crises in your life. I mean, you had the infection, mm -hmm. you had leukemia not once, but twice. Mm -hmm. um, what, what helped you mentally to get through that? Huh. Um, I, I think that my will to live is, uh, has always been very strong. Mm -hmm. I have never been suicidal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, And even if things get really bad, I, I never want to die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, um, and, uh, like I said, the love from other people kept me alive and, uh, um, and, uh, it still does. Yeah. Okay. And, and from specific people, yeah, yeah. From, yeah, from specific people. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what what would you what what advice would you give to people who are finding out that um, they've become infected? Um, what should they do? How should they react? How should they open up themselves with their families and friends? Where should they seek help? Um, if they're if they're if they test positive, they should find out from the institution that tested them mm -hmm. about. Um, medical care um, for for people who are HIV positive, um, and uh, they should start on medication um, immediately. Mm -hmm. And um, they used to like, for example, um, South Africa um, and also other um, 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 other uh, um, uh, former colonies. Uh, what's the word I want? Um, The, of the British Empire, uh, um, what are they called? Like um, Canada, Australia, um, uh, uh, parts of the British Empire, I guess. Is yeah, yeah. Um, British, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, they basically uh, actually the W World Health Organization basically used to say that um, if you're if um, a patient's um, CD4 count got below 500. Um, Then, then they, you should start treatment. Um, uh, that has changed. Uh, um, now it basically says you, that you should start treatment immediately. Okay. Um, and and the good thing about starting treatment immediately is that uh, because um, because undetectable means un, untransmittable, mm -hmm. um, that means that less people would will uh, re remain um, highly infectious for, to other people and. Um, and, and they won't be able to, if they're undetectable, they won't be able to transmit, um, transmit the disease or transmit the virus to other people. Um, and, uh, and if that happens to us, then you now can have less, uh, less infections. Okay. Okay. Um, um, uh, oh, I didn't really answer your question. <laughs> um, so what, uh, basically get, get on treatment, um, And it, it's not a, a it's not a deadly disease. It's a manageable disease, and um, and you can live um, with a long life lifespan and uh, live basically as long as you would have if you were not HIV positive. So it's not not a death sentence anymore. Right. It? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. What what can people do to support your cause? What Can they go? Where can they help you? Where can they um, help raise awareness? 
Um, good question. <laughs> um, something that I need to think about more. Um, uh, hmm. Basically, I would say just uh, um, put pressure on governments to uh, fund HIV cure and uh, and tell people that uh, it it is important that uh, the cures are found cures for HIV are found not not necessarily the way I was cured because that's dangerous and it's costly and mm. and very risky um, yeah very risky yeah um, but um, there there are many brilliant scientists working to find cures for HIV in other ways mm -hmm. uh, other ways that don't necessarily have to do with the way I was cured. And, oh, and that's also important. I was um, asked when I moved to to the United States. I moved to San Francisco, and uh, and I was asked by my doctor, um, who is a pretty well known um, doctor, a pretty well known researcher in the HIV cure world. world. I was asked to participate in the study, um, um, uh, and. Uh, Basically, they wanted to use my case to try to figure out how I was cured and um, mm -hmm. to help um, further the uh, the the knowledge and, um, re research toward finding cures for HIV. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I um, I basically um, did biopsies. I, um, a very intrusive colonoscopy, for example, mm -hmm. a, um, I had a lymph node taken out of my groin and um, biopsied and, uh, um, oh, and then the fact that I, um, basically they were trying to make sure that I, they could say that I did not have HEV in my, my body at all. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and, um, they the scientists basically study study that research and and, and try to, to find a way ways to cure other people. Okay, so you're you're offering yourself to science in a way. Yes. Yeah. To help, yeah. To help to cure. I see. Okay. Yeah. Why did you move move back from Berlin to um, the US after so many years? Uh. Um. Hmm. Good question. Um. My well. Michelle, um, the, the, that that former partner of mine, um, told me at one point that I needed to um, either. Well, I had an apartment that we shared, had, had shared together, um, and he he basically was moving with his new partner to this house, and uh, so I was alone in that apartment, and uh, and then. Um, he said that he thought that I should either um, find somebody to live with in Berlin um, who was willing to help take care of me um, for whatever um, whatever was still needed. Mm -hmm. um, it was a lot less less than before, um, and um, or I should move. Uh, oh, move into a home in Berlin or. I actually went to two homes and I thought, no, this isn't for me. I, th I thought my brain was better than, uh, was more functionable than theirs, the other mm -hmm. patients there. Um, and, uh, or, um, uh, or I could move back to the United States. And um, he thought I should move to Seattle. And I said, no, I want to move to San Francisco, which I did. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. And, so it, I kind of wish I didn't <laughs> in a way, but in, in other ways, in other ways, I don't know if I would have been as, um, I would have had as much influence in, <coughs> in um, HIV cure work uh, than I have now. Um, nice. uh, because most of the conferences on HIV cure take place in the United States and uh, um, so I'd be I'd be flying back to the United States a lot. 
Okay, okay. okay. So yeah, you have more influence over here and you can give more speeches yeah. and share stories. Yes, yeah, yeah, right. Has your life ch uh, changed in terms of awareness after all of this? After the, uh, you've been given one to three more chances in a way, has <coughs> anything changed um, in your life? Uh, yes, um, I would say, hold on, I need, I need to cough, sorry. <coughs> Water again. Um, I would say that uh, um, the biggest thing that, that's changed is that um, I th I think uh, I'm gonna go outside. I I think that uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you very well. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I think that, um, I think that, uh, I was a very selfish, per selfish person before, even, even with just having HIV. And, uh, um, I thought, thought too much about myself and not really, um, how we could help other people. And, um, and I think that's changed a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, basically, decided to get water. Uh, <clears throat> and basically, my whole mission is geared toward helping other people. <coughs> Excuse me. No worries. Um, yeah, so the, and that. Um, the, the, go ahead, go the cure ahead, gave you the cure gave you a purpose in a way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mm, okay. And and that purpose is more geared toward other people than myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you a religious or spiritual person? So do you think that's a a higher um, power saved you or? Uh, yes, I do think that I um had basically um rejected. Well, I grew up uh, in a Christian um, environment with my mother and uh, um. Uh, I kind of, because, because I didn't feel that, uh, that accepted, um, accepted that I was, uh, gay, mm -hmm. I kind of rejected it. Um, and, uh, um, and even, even when I was going through all of this, I, um, my mother said, I'm praying for you. And, and she told me that her or a lot of her friends were pay, praying for me and I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> um, I guess it's good energy. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. And, um, then, then I started thinking, well, why, yeah, why am I still around and why did all of these other people not make it? And, uh, and I think, uh, I think, that I know the reason the reason is because I my, my higher power I'll call it, um call it uh um wanted me to do what I've been doing and and uh and kept me around for that for that reason. And uh so yes I I do believe in higher power now. Okay. okay. Wonderful. Um it my higher power is not um not judgy and basically accepts uh, as long as I treat other people well and uh, uh, um, it, it, it's not based on, well, it's not completely based on Christianity and um, Judaism, the Ten, so <laughs> ten, ten Commandments. It's right. not in a way, it's not a specific religion, it's more of a sense of spirituality that you have. Yeah, right, right, exactly. I see. Exactly. In terms of the um, acceptance of gay people, do you feel any difference between Germany or Europe and the US? And um, how do you feel the development in general? Has, has acceptance <clears throat> been increased? Um, yeah, it has, it has definitely. Um, I think, um, like, amongst young people, um, well, well, I, I would and while we were critical of, um, 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 of how much they know about HIV and um, how how 
they're willing to take risks and stuff like that. Um, I think that um, basically it's completely changed. Um, when I grew up, uh, it started getting around at my high school, um, my senior year, that I was gay. Um, well, because I um, had basically told somebody that I was. And um, and uh, I would walk down the hall and people would yell or say, fuck it. Mm. Yeah. Um, and um, people weren't nice about it. And um, and for that reason, I had a miserable senior year of high school. Um, uh, um, yeah. Um, now that has completely changed. Um, when I moved, oh, when I moved to Berlin, um, I felt like, uh, like it was basically, uh, there wasn't any real stigma toward people that were gay. Um, gay was celebrate, celebrated. <coughs> um, and, um, uh, yeah, um, but it, at that point, it hadn't really changed that much in the United States until, and until basically, um, during the Obama administration, um, Obama finally, um, accepted that, uh, um, that gay people were normal and, hmm. yeah. um, and, uh, I think there, there, I mean, there are still people that go around calling people faggots and stuff like that. But, um, but it's not as, prominent as it used to be okay so the general perspective has slightly increased a lot okay <coughs> wonderful okay all right and so it's been really really interesting to hear about your story and since really gets to i'm in an interview sorry, oh, sorry. It's okay. yeah it's okay it's uh, yeah, I'm really glad that you made it and uh, that you can Thank tell you. your story and that you can teach and inspire other uh, others and and um, you know, put some effort in that important cause. So I always end these interviews with uh, two questions. Dr. John. Dr. John. Yeah. Dr. John. Um, yeah. Um, okay, sorry. No worries. Um, I, I always end, the, end these interviews with uh, two questions. And mm -hmm. um, the first okay. question is, you are... Truly one of a kind, you're an exceptional person and you're here to tell your story. Um, who do you find an extraordinary person that I might talk to next? Uh, if you haven't done it, Gary Hooter, Dr. Gary Hooter. Yeah, no, I haven't. I haven't. So the, the, the doctor um, that cured you. Yeah, he is, uh, I think he's still based in Dresden, uni University of Dresden. And his German's perfect, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so mine's pretty good. <laughs> okay, so so uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll reach out to him. And he, he's he's still active. He's still doing research in that field, or is he uh, back to his his area of? Uh, um. Yeah. He, hematology. He, yes, he um, is doing both. I think. Okay. Okay. Well. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, yeah he. Um, he, uh, well, because the German um, educational system is very hierarchical, as you probably know, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm sure Switzerland is similar. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, um, he, it wasn't very, very well taken that he, he was, um, somebody who's at, as such, at such a low level had um, found a cure, found a cure for HIV. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, yet, yeah. yet he um, did. Yet he did. So. Right. Yet he did. Yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah, it was difficult for him to get get through that. Um, he has, to a certain extent. Um, I know he still works with um, with um, people that are pretty prominent in HIV cure research in in Holland in the Netherlands. Um, Anne Marie. Um, Benzel mm -hmm. and Monique, uh, shoot, I don't think her, her last name. Um, anyway, oh, those are other people. Um, 
So Anne Marie Wenzel um, mm -hmm. is one, one person. Um, she is at the University of um, Utrecht. No, in Netherlands. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, um, I think she speaks German. I know she. Yeah, it doesn't matter. She speaks English very well. And I, in what in what field is he working? Is she working? Uh, H V. Oh, H V research. Okay. Yeah, H V research. Yeah. Um, lean toward H V cure. Okay. Um. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I'll. I'll try to reach out to those people. And then yeah. um, my last question, and I want to close it, you're getting guests, I uh, yeah. don't want to keep you much longer, is um, what's your final message to everyone who's listening or who's uh, viewing this, watching this? Um, my case is only, um, only important because uh, it proves that HEV can be cured. Mm -hmm. And basically, if... Um, something's happened once in medical science it can happen again mm -hmm. nothing is impossible in medical science in science in general actually okay. so it's important to keep doing the research to keep putting the efforts in and to yes keep yeah trying to find a cure. and one day one day um hiv will be curable and people won't have, won't have to worry about it anymore yeah yeah and it, I, I see thing, things in a positive light. So I, yeah. And you're the best example for it. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. I thank you so much for the conversation. It's really been very interesting. It's uh, very inspiring. I'm sure people will uh, love your story. And I thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you. Yeah, so thank you for what you're doing. I yes. appreciate it. And um, I'll hope to talk to you in the future. Yeah, same here. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank bye bye. You. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you for watching. And in a few seconds, you'll hear about the extraordinary person that I'm going to talk to in my next conversation. But before that, I need to ask you for your help. See, finding people who inspire and motivate you to make a change, that's what's most important to me. But to connect you with these amazing people and to bring you conversations that you will not find anywhere else, I need you to become a part of our journey. So please get involved and leave a comment below with your own questions and maybe even tell me who I should talk to next. And if you know anyone who might like this conversation, then please share it because I'm sure that they will like it too and it will help to grow this channel and to make an impact together. And by the way, on my website you will find all current and upcoming episodes including show notes and transcripts, background info, books and websites of my guests, podcast links and much more. And once you become an email subscriber, there is always some exclusive content, so don't forget to sign up and I'll see you in the next conversation. In the next episode, Rob talks to Paul P.J. James. A successful celebrity fitness trainer and model, there was one problem that Paul James certainly did not have, his body weight. But to better understand what goes on in the minds and bodies of his clients and others who struggle to lose weight, Paul embarked on an extraordinary journey. To gain an extra 50% of his body weight within six months and then lose it again within six months. But while the way up was easier than planned, Paul had to learn that losing the weight didn't quite go as easily as planned. Rob and Paul talk about Paul's shocking decline in physical and mental health, what goes on in our bodies on a bad diet, what a sustainable and healthy training regime and diet really looks like, and much more. Join the conversation now.